Well, if you'll take your copy of God's Word this morning, we'll be in 1 John chapter 4 when we get to our main text. So that'll be near the back part of your New Testament, 1 John chapter 4. And, you know, is there any name that is better or higher than the name of Jesus? There is not. I mean, his name is above all names. And in case we weren't aware of that, Scripture declares that to be the case, that there is no name higher than the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We get to either do that willingly because we recognize who he is, or at the end of our natural time here on earth, we will declare that because we will be face-to-face in His presence, and instead of seeing Him as our Father, we will recognize that He is our righteous judge. I like the first one way better than the second one, right? I mean, Jesus is amazing. And as we have started this summer, we have did so declaring that we are Jesus' people, that if His name is higher than every name, and that if He is to be the center of all things, then we definitely want to be His people. We are a group of people that exists simply because of Jesus. All things, Scripture tells us, came into being because of Him. That we have been transformed by Jesus if we are Jesus' people because anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. In fact, we have been born again. We have been born from above. All are born of water and, you know, born earthly, but only his children are ones who have been born again, born from above. And that ultimately we are to live for Jesus. Scripture tells us that whatever we do, we are to do to the glory of God. So Luke, the historian, has shown us that Jesus is more than just a son. He is more than just a religious teacher. He is more than just a martyr. John, the philosopher, has shown us that Jesus cares so much for us that he makes the first move to come to us that he offers us something ah, extraordinarily better than we could find on ourselves, and then ultimately that he is the only one that can overcome the obstacles that are within us. See, we always think about we want someone to overcome the problems out there, and, and that's important, right? But we have to admit, I mean, we really do, that our greatest obstacle in life is right here, right? It's us. It's the fact that without God, we are desperately broken. Without God, we are in what we would call sin, right? But in Him, He makes us new. He offers us something better. He overcomes the obstacle that we call sin. Matthew, the theologian, has shown us that Jesus calls us to that new life that he does show us this better way, and that he lets us know that it's available right now. It's available right now. Everything that Jesus has to offer is available right now, and all it can be summed up in that we need to do is in two words, follow me. Jesus said, follow me. And you might think, man, I don't have it all together. I don't know all the things. I don't got all the Bible words and don't know all the Bible stories. I want to let you know when Jesus told people to follow him, they didn't have it either. Follow me. We will start now. We will walk together and we will go through this together. I will show you the way that you should go. Sometimes, man, we we do that. We kind of follow at a distance, right? You know, we're kind of afraid. Sometimes we're right there. Sometimes we get distracted. But what Jesus is saying is saying, follow me. So we have seen who Jesus is. We have seen why Jesus and why we should care about him and ultimately how we can know him. And so if you've missed one of the last three weeks, I want to encourage you to to catch up online, not because, like, I'm an amazing pastor person, right? Not because, like, I think everything I say is so amazing, but because everything in life either rises or falls on those three questions. Who is Jesus? Why should I care? And how can I know him? 
Those questions will forever change your life in one way or another. They're questions that we need to explore, all right? The who, the why, and the how are questions that you need to make sure that you, as an individual, understand as a Jesus person. They are questions that you need to make sure that you can help other people answer. Why? So they can become Jesus people too, right? If we believe that Jesus is above everything, if we think that he is as awesome as we have sang about and that his word proclaims, then we ought to want other people to know him, right? To have him, to be able to follow him as we do. So we're going to continue this summer proclaiming that we live all for Jesus all the time, right? That that's the way our lives are supposed to be. If Jesus is who he says he is and we are his people, then our lives should be consumed with what it means to follow him in all areas of our life. So over the next several weeks, we're going to examine three pillars of our faith, and that is his truth, and we start there on purpose. Our calling means what has God called us to do? How are we to live and be as people? And then ultimately, your relationships, okay? If his truth is what it is, and our calling is to go live and do then that means that the way we live our life with our relationships, with our friendships, with our family, with our community needs to be purposeful, right? And needs to be dramatically maybe different than what it is now. So today, as Jesus people, if we're going to live all for Jesus all the time, then we must, we must live by his truth. So let's pray and ask him to bless our time together. There, Jesus, we do acknowledge that your name is above every name. We do acknowledge, God, that you are amazing and have made the way for us to have a right relationship with God the Father. There, Jesus, we do thank you that you have brought us here together and that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are going to open up your truth to us, God, so that we can understand, so that we can respond. And God, we want to thank you for all of these things, and it is in your name that we pray. Amen. So Luke, the historian, tells us that the people were amazed at his teaching. The his here is Jesus. The people were amazed at what Jesus taught. He was different. And I think that if you've looked at your copy of the Bible, you would have to acknowledge that what Jesus says and what he has done is totally different sometimes than what we expect what we would maybe even think is proper. Jesus taught through the miracles that he performed. When he raised the widow's son, he taught that new life comes from him. So think about that. The son was dead. Jesus spoke and told him not to be dead, and he was alive. All right? I mean, there's nothing more clear to saying that only God can give life like that, right? I mean, because that doesn't happen naturally. If it did, we wouldn't have hospitals, right? I mean, we would just like, boom, you're okay. But so we see here that he taught through miracles, and this miracle showed that only new life comes from him. Jesus taught through the parables that he shared. You know, those stories that that help us to think and to use nature and life around us to help us understand. He told this parable of the Good Samaritan, right? This person who was looked down upon and reviled just because of where he was born and why he chose to believe, but yet he helped this person who had been beat up and left for dead while all these good people just walked the other way and didn't want to have anything to do with him. And so through this parable, through this story, he taught that all people are important. Now, I know that sounds like something we should have picked up and forever kept in our hearts from kindergarten, right? But it's amazing that even today, as adults in our culture, living in what we would probably proclaim to be the greatest country in the world, right, that we still have a hard time believing that all people are valuable and all people are important because we still talk about 
others and thems, right, and theys. And I do realize that people are different. But Jesus valued everyone. Everyone is important. How do I know? For God so loved just me. For God so loved just you that God did not love the them. Mm -mm. For God so loved what? The world. We are all his creation. And he desperately desires for all of us to be his children. But the only way that we can become children of God is through who? Jesus that we're talking about. So he, he performed these miracles and taught through them. He, he spoke these parables and, and shared and, and taught them. And then ultimately, Jesus taught just flat out through the words he said. All right? Clearly, he says this, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so, simply as he spoke these words, he taught that we, catch that, we are to do the good things of God, right? We are to let our light shine. Well, where does our light come from? Naturally ourselves? No. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, right? He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the light that is not comprehended by those who reject or do evil. But because of him in us as his people, we are to let our light shine. And the only way that we can let our light shine is if we do what he has told us to do, right? So look at this. Jesus has taught us in a variety of ways. Through the miracles that he did, through the stories that he told, and through the words that he simply said. I think all of these things are pretty important, don't you? And so, does living by his truth then mean that we only pay attention to what Jesus did and spoke? I mean, if you've got one of those Bibles that actually has the words of Jesus in red, does that mean that that's all we got to pay attention to? Well, let's look at some other things Jesus said, because it's going to give us some understanding in that. See, he told those that were gathered on this mountain, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, but this is what he said. He said, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I think he's adding some value to some things that maybe you have in the front of your Bible, right? Maybe some of those pages that we don't turn to very often because we think that's dry or maybe that's hard to understand, but yet we see that it's important. He would later tell the disciples this, be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even the remotest parts of the earth. So he's telling those that hung around him, right, that were, experienced him for three years, he told them, you are to be my witnesses. So the things that they said and they did are important for us to understand, right? Folks like Matthew, who gave us a gospel, Mark, you know, who hung around with the disciples. We'll pay attention to these things. He said this of Paul, he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. So Jesus says it's not just about the direct words that we have maybe in red, but those that are contained in the law of Moses those that are in the prophets, along with the record of the disciples and the works of those who had firsthand knowledge of Jesus, people like Paul and others. So these accounts accomplish the purpose of God, and as Scripture, they are inspired by God, being useful to teach us what is true making us realize what is wrong in our lives, correcting us when we are wrong, and training us to do what is right. And before you say, well, that's a really nice interpretation, Pastor. I'm glad you put that together. I take no credit for those words, right? 
because the apostle Paul wrote them to a young man named Timothy, and we find that in 2 Timothy 3.16, that God's word is powerful, useful, and is transformative. And so it's not just about the words that we have in red. It's about what we have collected before us. So how then do we live by his truth? Well, that gets us to our primary scripture for today. They're found in 1 John chapter 4, where John, our philosopher, writes this. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone into the world. So we're being told here that we are to test, to verify that things are true, right? Do you see a need in today's world to be able to test and verify that which is true? Yes, we do. Okay. Verse 2 continues and says, By this you know the Spirit of God, that every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Not necessarily like the end time Antichrist, right? But anyone who is anti-Christ. Anybody who does not believe is not going to believe that Jesus came in the flesh, right? That's a fairy tale. That's a myth. That's something that, you know, you picked up somewhere else. But see, we know that that's not any of those things, that it's directly true because we know him. It says, of which you have heard is coming and is now already in the world. Verse 4 goes, you, you are from God. Okay, we're talking Jesus people here, little children, and you have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Now, man, let that one sink in and permeate your life like the rain has done the ground here in southwest Oklahoma, right? That's powerful. That's life-changing. Okay, while we might not always agree with what's going on in the world around us, we can rest assured that greater is he who is in us. Greater is Jesus than anything that is in this world, right? Whom have I to fear? And so he's letting us know this. Verse 5 goes on, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world. Sometimes if we're not careful, we get upset because people who don't know Jesus act exactly like the fact that they don't know Jesus, right? That they espouse philosophies, that they say things that seem to go against the natural order, that they do things that you just go, I cannot believe that. But you know, if they don't have Jesus, what else would we expect? Because let's go back and look at our lives as Jesus people. What were we like before Jesus came and changed us? How did we live? What did we believe? What were the things that we said? How did we act? Well, the world acts the way they do because they are of the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and li the world listens to them, right? So you wonder, how can a mob do what mobs do? It tells us right here. They are of the world, and they listen to it, and it, it's the mob mentality, right? Verse 6, though, we are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So, verse 7, beloved. Let us love one another, for love is from who? Love is from God. So that means when I go hashtag love is love, no, 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 that doesn't work. Because if love is from God, that means what true love is matches the character, the nature, the statement, everything about God, right? That's what true love is. If we don't have God in our lives, what we have is a pale imitation of love. We might have some serious like. We might have a little bit of lust, but man, we don't have real love 
because where does real love come from? God. And so love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. And so, whoa, that's one to cause us to pay attention, right? Because if we are not showing love, John's telling us what? Maybe we don't know God like we think we do. And so, God is love. So, here's three things for us to wrap our heads around this morning to make sure that we live by His truth. First one's this, we live by His truth when we test the spirits, okay? And so that means test. I'm glad you need to bring some copy of God's Word with you to church. You need to know it and live it. Man, I want you to trust what I say, but man, I also want you to test and verify what I say, right? Because I am not perfect because I stand behind a piece of wood on Sunday mornings, right? And so you need to know what truth is, because you have God's Spirit in your life. You have direct access to the Lord in the same way that I do, right? And so we live by His truth when we test His spirits. Simply put, we evaluate everything by Him. All right, that's the key. If you want to test what is true, you got to make sure that what you are testing it by is 100% accurate. Nobody wants to measure something when an inch says that it's three quarters of an inch, right? That's going to mess you up. You've got yourself a bad ruler. You know, if somebody teaches you that red is green, okay, we've, we've got problems. I mean, because whatever you, you're using to evaluate your color spectrum is off. And so we evaluate everything by him. Is it consistent with the natural order of creation? and the witness of God. See, Scripture tells us all things were created in Him and through Him. So there's stuff that we can learn by nature out there. But here's the biggest one. Scripture tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is a measuring method that never fails, right? You know, I read an article where the the United Kingdom, Great Britain, uh, when they moved out of the European Union, they when they moved, when they moved into it, they had to adopt a a standard set of measurements, rules, and and different things that were outside of their country. And so one of the things that they had to give up was the imperial method of measure, right? You know, things in inches and yards and pints and quarts and stuff like that. And, and so when they, when they left that, they went back to that symbol of measurement that they all knew and understand. Now, I know science and metric system, it does. It works out really well, right? Basis of 10, it's really nice. Uh, but yet when you grow up around, you know, quarters, inches, and halves, and we put people on the moon with that, you know, I'm kind of okay with it. And so the idea here is that we measure by a standard that is never going to change. You know, we used to measure things by hands. Maybe we still do with horses. People over there in, in that country I'm talking about, Great Britain, they measure their weight in stones, right? How many stones are you? Now, they have come and defined what a stone actually is. Uh, but, but if they didn't, I mean, we, we, is it this kind of stone? Or am I only one stone, but it's a big stone? Jesus' measure doesn't change. Totally consistent. So we must test what is said and what is done around us by examining it through what God has said and done to see if it's right to believe and to follow. And if it, if it is in agreement, it will confess or align with Jesus in a way that is verifiable. So you take what you hear and what you observe, and when somebody tells you that's truth, you measure that with what you know has been demonstrated in God's revelation of who he is. And if it matches that, you can go with it. If it doesn't, whoa. 
Now, see, we've got to pause there for a moment because we have to examine our lives as Jesus people and ask ourselves this very important question. Do we value Jesus as the ultimate standard of truth for our life? Because if we don't, we're going to be off. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus has to be the ultimate measure by which we determine what is truth. And so we have to accept what he has for us. So we live by his truth when we test his spirits. We live by his truth when we listen to God. So simply put, that means we learn what he says. So yes, you can learn about him from what I am sharing with you on a Sunday morning. But if you're only learning stuff one day a week, four times a month, or okay, well, okay let's, get, let's get kind of picky in particular. Let's be honest about American Christianity. Are we really always attending four Sundays a month? Is it three Sundays, or is it two Sundays, or is it ever so many Sundays? And you know what I'm saying? If this is all we're getting, man, great, but don't you think it should be more? And you might ask yourself, how do I learn more about Jesus? And see, that gets me back to that book that you have, whether it's on your tablet or your phone or in your lap, right? You spend time in that. You put some effort into learning what you need to do, okay? I've ridden in some big green machines at Harvest. I've not actually driven big green machine, all right? Do I know how to start and make it work? Do I know that once you get out in the field, what you do with said machine other than you drive it around and try not to hit things? No. Do you know how you do that? Many of you do. How? Somebody taught you? You chose to learn, right? There is an owner's manual, and if I'm going to drop the kind of coin that you have to drop to get a big green machine, I'm going to make sure that I don't tear it up, right? Okay, if we value what you've got in your barn, how much more important is you, right? That is of the utmost importance. And God has given us the manual of his truth so that we don't mess up the non-green machine, right? That's why we need to pay attention. There are so many competing voices and thoughts that are in this world. There is a way that often seems right to us, right? But man, Scripture says that can be disastrous. I mean, sometimes we do good, and sometimes we say, hey, that looks like that could be fun, right? I mean, you know the type of thoughts. Hold my drink. I'm going to go do something. Never ends well, all right? But only God has the words of life. Catch that. Not just words of good, words of life. What's the opposite of life? Death. Aren't you glad he doesn't have the words of death? Oh, I want to join that party, okay? If everything other than him is death because he has life, then why would I want to listen, pay attention, base my life on anything that wasn't his word of life? Profound question. And so while we might be hesitant, see, I put that in there because you think, okay, I've built up this great straw man, right? Where it's like, why would you not want to do that? But yet we are stubborn people and we say, I don't want to do that. I want to do it my way, just like the proverbial two-year-old, right? But we don't want to stay there. So while we're hesitant to rely upon them, his words reveal a direction for our life that includes our welfare rather than harm that will give us a future and a hope. That's why. So why... Would we not want to listen when he tells us that all he has provided is a way to overcome, right? I have overcome the world. He's provided us a way to be victorious. Does anybody want to be not victorious, right? Does anyone want to say, yep, today's the day I lose? No. I mean, we want to hope. And he gives us that hope in Jesus. We can be victorious in life that is greater than any of our expectations, all right? 
what God has to offer is better than anything you can dream up. How do I know that? Well, because God's promised us heaven. Do you, have you got heaven all figured out? Do you know what heaven's supposed to be like? I mean, I know his word tells me a few things, right? Purdy gates. I've never seen pearly gates. Seen shiny gates. Have I seen streets of gold? No. Have I seen clear water? Not, rare, not often in southwest Oklahoma, but I mean, I've seen it, but a crystal sea? No. Do I know what it's like to live in a place where there's no conflict, where lions and lambs lay down with each other? I, I don't. But those are all descriptions of heaven, right? And you think, okay, but is there more? Yeah, it says some more things, but it doesn't tell me everything, and I can't wrap my head around it, and if I could fully understand heaven, would it be grand enough? It wouldn't. And so he's telling us here that there is a life with him that is beyond our expectations if we only listen and respond to what he says. That's how we live this unrestrained life. That's how we live by his truth. Here's the last one for us this morning. We live by his truth when we love like Jesus. That simply means we do what pleases him, okay? Love doesn't have to be complicated. Yes, we write lots of songs about it, and somebody writes poetry for whatever reason. Lots have been said about love, but God made the first move towards us, and that's what love is, all right? And so that's what we are to show to others. In fact, God's nature is love, it's our definition, as I said. It's our expression, and it needs to match who God is. If what we're calling love does not match God, then it's not love. So we do that when we abide in Him, when we cling to Him above everything else, when we look out for the interest of others. That is loving because isn't that what Jesus did for us? You know, He came to seek and save that which was lost. Us, we were lost. And so He was looking out for our welfare like a shepherd. And that we make sure that everything that we do is done for the glory of God. Now, to do that, does that mean that we're constantly saying like Jesus stuff and Jesus words and whatever? Well, you can, but no, not necessarily. It means that you put his priorities, his preferences, his desires, his way of life, his words. That's what permeates you and sets your purpose, your way of being. You understand what I'm saying? To live all for Jesus all the time means we just simply do the things that God prefers. Does God prefer me to listen to this? Does God prefer me to participate in this? Does God prefer me to act this way in this situation? What is the way that God would prefer me to be as I'm now in this situation of life? You see what I'm saying? That's what he is telling us here. So to love Literally, that word agape that we occasionally bring out from the, you know, the, old, the New Testament text that's written in Greek, you know, it really simply means to do the things that God prefers. And God preferred to die for us, to save us, right? And so that's the measure of love that we're supposed to have for other people. And when we do this, we're living by His truth. So John lets us know that we are to do these things because we know Jesus, because we believe in Jesus. And what that means to know him means that we have experiential firsthand knowledge concerning him. He has done something directly in your life so you know it, all right? Experience. Do you have a Jesus experience? But it also means that we have been persuaded by evidence. That's what belief is that you have seen the evidence, and it's not something blind that you go, oh, why not? It's that you've seen God do this, you've believed it, you've seen the evidence, you've read the reading, and you say, that's what I want, all right? So John's saying, you know, and he's saying, you believe, all right, that he, Jesus is who he says he is, and what he says is true, so here's where we bring it all together to wrap it all up this morning. So because Jesus' people have already agreed to follow him, then we should not have to be convinced to do what he says. But yet it seems 
that often we have to be convinced to do what Jesus has already told us to do. Am I supposed to tell this person about Jesus? Is that a question that we ever need to ask? No. Am I supposed to love somebody? Is that a question that we are ever needing to ask? No, these are things that Jesus has already answered for us. We need to stop expecting God to convince us of what we already know. We should do it. You're going to love this one. Come straight out of Luke 5 because he says so. Can we live with that? If we just stopped right there, can we live by his truth just because he says so? Are, are you guys willing to accept that? I mean, because that's what it says. But he doesn't just go there. Scripture tells us we should do it because every word of God proves true. It's always true. It's not just true in this week or in this month or in this circumstance. When is God's word always true? Always. So should we do it just for that? I mean, he just said so, that's good enough, but here he's telling us it's always true. Ultimately, we should do it because Jesus said, if we love him, we will keep his commandments. I said so. It's true. You love me. You love me so much that you've already told people you're a Jesus person, right? You show up at the church on occasion. You occasionally do my stuff. This is it. We live by his truth. Could it be that our world is so messed up because we inconsistently live by his truth? Right? I mean, if lost people are going to be lost and act lost because that's who they are, Maybe the problem is us. Man, I don't like saying that. So we need to make sure we live by his truth. This is the way James is going to sum it all up for us. We must prove ourselves to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. I mean, if I was going to make an us and them kind of statement, right, we would think that the them are the ones that are deluded. But I think this says we are the ones who are deluded if we're not living by what we claim. So if we take the name of Jesus, if we claim to be Jesus people, then we are supposed to live for him all the time, right? Not just part of it. And if we do that, he partners with us to change everything that is broken. Man, I'm excited about that. I want you to be excited about that. I want us to be people who make sure we live by this. And so I want to ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes, and we're going to have a brief moment of invitation. This morning, I want you to know that you can live by his truth. You can respond to his love. You can choose to follow him. You've heard his truth today. You've listened to it. I hope you've kind of tested it and thought, okay, does that make sense? And if you want to know Jesus, if you want to be saved, I want to encourage you when we stand up to step out, come forward, talk to me, and I'm going to tell you some more truth about Jesus. I want you to know Jesus today. Don't hold back. New life comes from him, you're important, and it's the best thing you can do. But here's the last thing I want to say to my Jesus people here today this morning is this. Man, the world doesn't need any more pretenders. We need to make sure that we are in agreement, that we're not a counterfeit. We need to make sure we have a habit of listening, and we need to make sure we're actively loving. If we got a problem with that, we got a problem with God. We don't want a problem with God. We want him to change us. So if that's you, tell him you're sorry. Ask him to help you. And choose to be different. The big fancy Bible word for that is called repentance. And that's what we all need. Come and be saved. Make sure you live faithful for him.